Hello and uh, welcome to the Middle East Report. In this program today we're looking at the election of uh, Donald Trump to the US presidency and uh, what that means for Israel and the Middle East. Warm welcome to the program and uh, my special guest to discuss the US presidential election and what that means for Israel and the Middle East is my good friend Neil Lazarus from Awesome Seminars. Neil, it's always a pleasure to have you on the Middle East Report and I always enjoy it when you're here in London and we can do a program together. We've done a program over the years so it's great so to have you. Thank you for having me back and it was such beautiful weather outside. <laughs> no, freezing, uh, freezing. No, absolutely. You should have been here in the summer when we had one of the uh, hottest summer we's ha we've had in a long time. So can you give us um, a little bit of an update? I know that you've been traveling for like uh, four weeks now. You've been in the States and now you're here sp uh, with speaking engagements in the UK. Um, show life what's like on, on the road for you. Well, it's been very dynamic because everything is changing from that night where everyone said that Hillary was going to win and Donald does. By the way, I predicted it six months ago, so I was very proud of my, myself. Um, once Brexit happened, we could see, and we'll talk a little bit about the connection between Brexit and Trump, uh, changes are taking place globally. So the big question everyone's going to be asking in Israel is, how does this new world affect us? And I think there's going to be a number of huge changes there. Absolutely. So let's have a first look at some of the work being done by uh, Neil and his organization, Awesome Seminars. And uh, this is Neil in Jerusalem talking about the challenges facing Israel at this time. My name is Neil Lazarus. I'm a keynote speaker and I work around the world explaining about Israel. I speak to over 30,000 people a year in around five different countries. The image of Israel seems to be getting worse and worse. We are going to be showing you in this video how to answer some of those questions that we all face. Israel is an apartheid state, the fence, the wall, massacres in Gaza. We're going to show you how to answer very quickly, very easily, and in a way that is relevant to your audience. One of the biggest issues that you will be asked about is the question of human rights. In particular, they will ask you about why has Israel built this wall or even apartheid wall? And second of all, what about the checkpoints where Palestinians have to wait for uh, a long time to get into Israel. We would love to live in countries without fences, without walls, without checkpoints. It used to be that case. We built it because of what happened in the Second Intifada. Day after day, suicide bombers were coming into every major city in Israel and killing women, children and families on buses or eating in restaurants. The moment that Israel increased its security, those suicide attacks, those bombings stopped. The real problem is not fences and walls which can be brought down. The real problem is the Hamas and Fatah groups who are committed to murdering Israelis downtown Jerusalem and elsewhere. One of the biggest questions at the moment is, what about Israel's policy of building settlements in the West Bank? Isn't building settlements against the peace process? Isn't uh, it opposing any plan for a Palestinian state? Perhaps you can agree that there is a discussion and a debate in Israel about those settlements, that many people in the Labour Party would disagree with it, that they represent a Zionist perspective which is legitimate. On the other hand, I think it's also important to bring out, too, that 
Israel has a right to build in the West Bank because there's a historic connection of the Jewish people that goes back thousands of years. At the same time, I think it's important to refer to what happened in Gaza. We have a situation where we did what they demanded. We left Gaza, we removed nine, 10,000 people from their homes, and within a couple of years, we had rockets in every part of the state of Israel, from Haifa in the north to Mitzvah Ramon in the south. The real question is, are the settlements the block to peace, or is it the fact that Palestinians don't recognize Israel's right to be a Jewish state? One of the biggest claims you're going to get is what happened in Gaza? Why did Israel kill 2,000 people, over 500 children? The answer is simple. Israel did everything to stop the human tragedy that took place. Dropping leaflets, phoning people, and warning before any military action. The truth, which you need to get across, is that Hamas used its own population as human sacrifices. What they did was criminal, a war crime. They put their own missiles in schools, hospitals, uh, in UN buildings, and then fires at Israel. Despite Israel's attempts to minimize human casualties, the consequences were inevitable. Another big question that we face is why does Israel restrict goods coming into Gaza? So the reality of the siege on Gaza is a myth. The restrictions they're put in Gaza are only to prevent weapons coming in. Go to Gaza, you're gonna see trucks of aid and food coming in. The only restrictions are there to check that they are missiles not coming in, rockets are not coming in from Iran. Aid, medicine and food are being delivered daily by Israel to help the Palestinians. One of the most craziest claims against Israel is that we're an apartheid state. It's ridiculous. If you go to Hebrew universities, there's Jews and Arabs studying together. If you go to the court system in Israel, we have Arab judges. We have Arab members of Knesset sitting next to Jewish members. I would argue, and I think you've got to pick up this point, that apartheid and its use of it against Israel delegitimizes the struggle of black South Africa for its own liberation of its own country. So remember the following. One, know who your audience is. You're gonna to have to change the language that you use according to the audience. Two, have a message. What do you wanna say? What's the message you wanna get across? And say it in 30 seconds. Show empathy. Show an understanding that we would love to live in countries without fences, without walls, without checkpoints. If you have empathy, your message is gonna be more effective. Talk about peace. Keep positive. Always look for the light at the end of a, a, a tunnel. If there's one thing I could really recommend to you, is learn more. I want you to go onto the internet and look, read, discover. Get as much information as you possibly can from all the different resources. And in one sentence, be prepared. That's the most powerful tool that you can have to be an ambassador for Israel.
thanks for that uh, video presentation. You can all be ambassadors for Israel now. And uh, Neil's gave, given uh, some very, very good guidelines and some very good pointers about how to speak up on behalf of Israel. So I have to ask you, Neil, after seeing that excellent presentation, and I think you should make a documentary, I think you'd be good at it. Um, I, have to, I have to ask you, what are the key challenges facing Israel at uh, this time? Well, first of all, uh, we still have a rise of anti-Semitism globally. We're seeing, uh, in particular, on the left, people always talk and imagine uh, anti-Semites as belonging to the far right. We're also seeing a rise, especially in Britain, where we're broadcasting from, is uh, uh, the rise of uh, anti-Semitism on the, the left. We're also seeing challenges uh, to, and people still questioning Israel's right to exist. I, I can't believe, after nearly 70 years of uh, existence, people are still questioning uh, Israel's right to exist. Perhaps one of the key points which I think we're going to ch see changing is the question of the Iran deal. Remember, under Obama, Iran got a free hand to go ahead and develop its own nuclear capability. It looks like that could be changing under the uh, Trump uh, administration. So where we're going foreign policy-wise is uh, we're going to have to wait and see. Last one I would add is the threats from Gaza your viewers are familiar with. But keep an eye on the north, Hezbollah, which at the moment is entrenched in Syria and Lebanon, have the capability uh, and have the potential of a war against Israel which would make the war uh, that we had with Hamas look like peanuts. I remind you that um, Hezbollah has the capability of firing over 120,000 rockets, that's the arsenal, compared to, say, Hamas's 9,000. Very challenging. But also the other challenge facing Israel from uh, Hezbollah is the fact that they've been uh, involved in propping up Assad's regime. So they're combat ready, uh, which is also another danger. Absolutely. No, I'm not suggesting they're running towards a, a war with Israel now, but everyone does look towards the north uh, because unfortunately, as we know, it's not a matter of if there will be another conflict. The matter is always when. So Israel's uh, certainly keeping its eyes open at what's happening over the border. Now, you were in the States at the time of the U.S. Uh, presidential oh, election. Oh, yes. Which is probably one of the most hotly contested, most angry, bitter election in American It history. was a long night. <laughs> uh, what was it like uh, on election night um, as the results started to come in? Because everyone was forecasting that it was almost a dead cert that Hillary Clinton was going to be America's uh, 45th president. It was absolutely uh, fascinating to watch. And the main thing uh, which to see, which I found absolutely fascinating, was how mainstream media totally misread, totally misread the political map, whether it was the pollsters, uh, whether it was CNN, uh, all were saying that Hillary would win. The reality was that they were out of touch of what was going on in mainstream um, America. So personally, I wasn't surprised. I think there is a connection between Brexit and what happened with Trump. I think it's a global phenomenon. I think it's a backlash uh, towards uh, uh, sorry, a backlash uh, uh, against uh, globalization. Globalization left uh, the world without state identity. And now we're seeing a resurgence of people saying, we want our country, we want uh, to work for our interests. Uh, and at the same time, we're also seeing um, that uh, this idea of a very liberal everything can go, there's a backlash to it today. As far as the Jewish population is concerned, they're, they're caught somewhere in the middle. The, the Jewish population is, is divided. Uh, on the one hand, it's clear that Trump will give Israel a much freer hand of what to do. On the other hand, many people are perhaps uh, more suspicious of many more of his conservative uh, beliefs at home. Absolutely. So we have to ask, uh, you know, what does a, a Trump presidency mean for the United States? And if we first in terms of domestic policy, then foreign policy. But um, what was your action to uh, the Trump's victory from the uh, American jury? Split. And it was ma uh, fascinating to watch. Uh, on the one hand, I, you know, when I was in New York and Los Angeles, uh, there was shock for many of the Jewish populations there. They have uh, very liberal values. Um, and, and, and American jury, I think, has always been split to that extent of liberal domestically, uh, but very pro-Israel. And there's always that balance of where and how, how do I vote. On the other hand, uh, I jumped over to somewhere like Arizona. Um, they, were very, they were very pleased. So American jury, I think, is, 
is always caught between a, a rock and a hard place, trying to, to uh, define itself of, of where it is. Uh, a recent poll came out that uh, the vast majority of uh, Jews in America divide, uh, use or define liberalism as a part of their own self-identity. So that also will uh, affect how they relate to, to Trump. Absolutely. But what does uh, Trump mean for Israel? I mean, looking at the way he's setting his uh, uh, new administration up, the key personnel he's putting in terms of foreign policy, uh, they're, they're all hawks and they're pro-Israel. So you're, uh, what you're seeing, uh, you know, the official line that you always hear from everyone in Israel is uh, the Israeli government will work with every member of... Yeah, right. The reality is what we're also seeing is a feeling that on the right of the political spectrum, Israel's going to get a much freer hand. And we're already seeing talk about more building within Jerusalem, um, which would have caused uh, problems under Obama. So I think that the government, especially the Netanyahu government, um, can sit back and relax. Is that good for Israel? Is that not good for Israel? That will depend on, uh, upon who you uh, ask. But also what, what's so interesting, um, if you compare the United States with Israel, is that if uh, the United States have, a, say, um, a, a Republican uh, presidency, then usually what follows suit is, is the left take power in Israel and vice versa. So uh, there's interesting parallels that seem to happen. Are you um, suggesting that... Netanyahu can get replaced. No, no. Well, I don't know. He's, he served a few uh, terms. Could you but tell I think the members of the opposition because they're still uh, trying to work it out. No, I, th I think uh, I think the Israelis feel um, much safer. So it's amazing how, for example, if there's a left-wing government like uh, Obama. The, uh, the Israelis all vote to the right and stay to the right with security issues. But as soon as you have someone, for example, the, the Republicans win, then they usually swing a little bit more to the left. In I, 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 di I disagree with you on that. Uh, to, to some extent, what we're seeing uh, globally is a shift to the right. I think within Israeli politics, there's a, a problem which has emerged, which has look, traditionally it was always that the right wing had been split uh, between groups. We had groups such as Somit and, and so on and so forth. Uh, they were split and the left was, had bigger blocks. What we're seeing today is the center left, uh, whether it's Lapid, whether um, it's all the, the small parties in the middle are actually splitting the center left vote. So it makes it much easier for Netanyahu to build a coalition. Um, and I think that that's what's happening today is there's too many egos, too many parties uh, from the center left. And that's really what's causing them the problem. So let's have a, a look now at uh, Donald Trump um, talking about uh, his support for Israel and in response, the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's response to Trump's election victory in the presidential election 2016. I love Israel and honor and respect the Jewish faith and tradition. And it's important that we have a president who feels the same way. For me, respect and reverence for Judaism is personal. My daughter Ivanka and my son-in-law Jared are raising their children in the Jewish faith, always reminding me the important values and lessons we learn about leadership, resolve, and families in Jewish tradition. My administration will stand side by side with the Jewish people and Israel's leaders to continue strengthening the bridges that connect not only Jewish Americans and Israelis, but also all Americans and Israelis. Together, we will stand up to the enemies like Iran, bent on destroying Israel and her people. Together, we will make America and Israel safe again. President-elect Trump, my friend, congratulations on being elected President of the United States of America. You are a great friend of Israel. Over the years, you've expressed your support consistently, and I deeply appreciate it. I look forward to working with you to advance security, prosperity, and peace. Israel is grateful for the broad support it enjoys among the American people, and I'm confident that the two of us, working closely together, will bring the great alliance between our two countries to even greater heights. May God bless America. May God bless Israel. May God bless our enduring alliance. 
There you can see there a very happy uh, looking uh, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu with the announcement that Donald Trump uh, won the US presidential election. Uh, talking about Israel, I mean, he, Netanyahu himself must be incredibly relieved, isn't he, after all that pressure from the Obama administration. Um, you know, uh, United States, in terms of the UN, half-heartedly supported Israel on many votes. Israel felt that under the Obama administration there was no real backing and real support. I know that he helped Israel in terms of supplying a military aid package to Israel, but I think on the whole Israelis and the Israeli government felt that, that America didn't have Israel's back. But that looks to be changing again with the election of Donald Trump as, as America's next president. I think there's a natural alliance um, and it's personalities as well. We, we always talk about politicians as politicians. They're real people. And I think that there was a chemistry between Netanyahu uh, and Obama where there was no love lost. Uh, there was a personal issue. They came from very different backgrounds. Obama obviously coming from a much more liberal background. Uh, remember Netanyahu's uh, brother was killed by terrorists. Uh, he's also a uh, neoconservative economically. So I, I think there was a personal clash going on there at the same time. So we looked at that, that clip. He's smiling. He's definitely smiling. I throw into the discussion, though, it does raise issues for American jury because the vast majority of American jury have uh, a liberal value which supported Obama, uh, even though he was more questionable uh, regarding Israel. And one of the conversations we were having all the time when I met uh, different people in the States was, as a Jew, do I support the president or do I support, uh, um, do I support the president for his foreign policy or his domestic policy? And I think that that's always been a part of the dilemma of American jury. So um, in, in response to the election of uh, President Trump, and you, you talked about um, there's been a, a global shift away from globalism, um, almost a way of punishing the liberal elites that are trying to create international quasi-organizations, a lack of sovereignty. Um, you know, what does this mean? Because Israel itself is a fiercely patriotic and nationalistic country. To know that they have someone similar um, in Trump in the White House and also in 10 Downing Street with Theresa May, surely this is a, a good time for Israel um, in light of uh, world developments. No, absolutely. I think to, to that extent that the leaders are speaking the same language. We've always said that Israel is a canary uh, in the mine. What happens with us in Israel first then happens in the rest of the world. Suicide bombing, uh, attacks on civilians, uh, Islamic fundamentalism. Sound familiar? It's now Europe. Well, we've been suffering that for 10 years or so. I now think that many of the leaders are all on the same uh, page. Having said that, I do come back um, to that issue of do we support, don't we support uh, Trump for American, uh, American jury? The jury is out. Um, and if we want to really tap on that, the whole of Israel, of Am Yisrael, of Jews, Israel, America, where, we, where they fit in, uh, that not everyone is happy with it. And also there are many concerns within the uh, American jury over some of the comments that... Um that Donald Trump mentioned, mentioned during his election campaign, particularly his reference to Mexicans and other minority groups in the United States that many felt that maybe some of his campaign rhetoric was bordering on racism or if not, um, in some cases, anti-Semitism. Uh, and, and sexism uh, as well. Yeah. Uh, in addition to that, we have to look at some of his uh, recent appointees, people who are now going to be joining him, which is really what to look for. What's Absolutely. the team he's making? Who are his advisors? Uh, Trump is running, will run the White House like he does a business. He's going to have those people loyal coming in. And there are a few questionable characters there at the same time. One thing to look out for Trump is I, I am detecting that he has his foreign policy based on a business mind. So when he talks about we're losing money on NATO, we ha why do we have to uh, defend everybody else, that we can't afford it, well, sometimes foreign policy can't be based on whether it's profitable or not, but rather global interests. So we have a businessman in the White House, and, and I think that that's something to, to tap onto as well. It's a very different mindset. No, very much, and I think that that's a good, good way of looking at it. Now, we're in a kind of, kind of dangerous period now, aren't we? From the election night all the way up until uh, Donald Trump's inauguration was somewhere around the 20th of January 2017. Um, what can Obama do 
during those last couple of months in office because there's a lot of speculation that there could be another a UN vote on a, on to recognize a unilateral Palestinian state and this time the Obama administration might work for it. Is that a real possibility? I think there is a danger there. I think there is a fear there and we've seen in the past that in the last months where they've got nothing to lose, they uh, don't have to be accountable to anybody. Presidents can try and set the agenda for uh, the uh, next uh, uh, president. So all of those things you mentioned, uh, action in the United Nations, I think are a real threat. Uh, and I think Israel is certainly looking uh, and keeping an eye on, on what's happening there. I throw also into the discussion we're having is Iran. Absolutely. Uh, because Iran now is seeing a president who isn't going to commit uh, to the Iran deal, who has already ordered, let's see how we can uh, prevent more damage. I mean, the Iran deal was a disaster for Israel. It was a disaster for APAC. The, the fact that APEC couldn't even stop it is another story. There is a threat that uh, perhaps we could start to see a nuclear arms race with Iran uh, trying to move forward at a much quicker rate uh, to develop uh, nuclear capability. And that will clearly have an impact on the Middle East. Absolutely. And also it'd be very, very difficult to put back the sanctions on Iran, wouldn't it, after these billions of sanctions relief that the Iranian regime has received in, in order actually not to do anything particularly, apart from just slow down its production of, uh, of nuclear weapons. But which, the agreement, they, which they're not. Exactly. So, uh, you know, there was no discussion on Iran's support for international terrorism, no discussion on Iran's horrendous human rights abuses, nothing talking about Iran's insurgency throughout the world by supporting um, Islamist terrorist organizations. Well, that's because everyone was so busy condemning Israel. Uh, <laughs> the, the double standard that we have is, is quite amazing. If you have a look what's going on in Iran, if you have a look what's going on in most of the Arab world, uh, the fact that they still condemn uh, Israel for so-called human rights violation, again, is that double standard, which I think anyone who's a friend of Israel and supporting Israel uh, is, is very much aware and, and frustrated by. Absolutely. I suppose the other thing we, we can tie in, what do you think the reaction will be in the Arab world? Because we know that uh, many Arab leaders haven't been impressed with President Obama themselves, see the same sort of, um, have the same sort of security concerns that Israel does, particularly from the threat posed by Iran. So I'm sure that uh, the uh, General Sisi, for example, in Egypt will be happy because we know that Obama supported the Muslim Brotherhood and supported Morsi and didn't really... Um, bring any legitimacy towards uh, General Sisi, despite the fact that 30 million Egyptians took to the streets in Cairo and Egypt in uh, 2013 to see the overthrow of the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, what, 100%, I, th I think you, you hit the nail on the head. The good news about the Iran deal was it reinforced some of Israel's friends and allies in the region. So the fact that Iran could get uh, a nuclear bomb actually brought that old saying in the Middle East, your enemy's enemy is your friend, to reality. Look, the Saudis today are, are less worried about Israel and much more worried about Iran. And we're seeing that across the board, especially with the Sunni, uh, many of the Sunni countries. So I'm guessing that the reaction of the Arab world uh, towards Trump will also be based on those lines of pro-Iran or, or worried by Iran. Um, if we're seeing a president which is going to take Iran on, is going to try and do damage control as far as the Iranian uh, deal is concerned, uh, those Arab countries will be starting to support uh, the government. It's fascinating times. I have to also ask you um, about Mike Pence, his uh, new vice president. So for evangelical Christians, it's quite amazing to see someone of his stature actually becoming the second most powerful man in the world. And if anything were to happen to Donald Trump, sadly, then he could be in prime position to become the next president. Uh, the world is changing. <laughs> uh, and uh, again, that, has, that certainly was noticed uh, uh, by the electorate in, in the United States. Um, I know for many of your viewers, he'd be a welcome uh, asset to the government. Uh, and for many others, He's a worrying character. So it's very divisive. Uh, no one quite knows, to know, knows what's going to happen. One of the things I would look out for is how much is the rhetoric of the election campaign changing once they, become, uh, uh, be, they, they place themselves in power. And I think that that's going to be interesting. He's already talking about, well, I'm not going to deport everybody, maybe people with a criminal re record. Is he going to be watering down? I think that that's something we need to, ta to, to keep an eye on as well. Absolutely. So let's have a look now at Mike Pence talking about his love for Israel 
and the Jewish people. Shalom, Israel Republicans. I'm Governor Mike Pence. It's a great honor for Donald Trump and I to stand together with you tonight in support of Israel. And I'm deeply humbled to be speaking to you at this historic time and with all of you there in that special holy place of Jerusalem, the eternal home of the Jewish people. Over the course of this campaign, many people have asked me why our ticket stands so strongly with Israel. Donald Trump and I stand with Israel because Israel's fight is our fight, because Israel's cause is our cause. We stand with Israel for the same reasons good people everywhere stand with Israel. We stand with Israel because her cause is just, because her values are our values, and because her fate is our fate. Israel is not just our strongest ally in the region. As I've said for so many years, Israel is our most cherished ally in the world. Currently, Israel lives under the ominous shadow of a threatening neighbor who seeks to wipe her off the face of the earth. Yet Donald Trump and I understand that Israel is not hated by her enemies for what she does wrong, but rather for what she does right. Like the United States, Israel is hated by terrorists and the failed states that support them. She is hated by too many progressives because she is successful and her people are free. There's one more thing that Donald Trump and I understand and will never shrink from proclaiming. Like the United States, Israel defends herself with an army of citizen soldiers who fight their nation's battles with decency, humanity, and restraint. As Israel shows the world how to turn scarcity into plenty, sickness into health, poverty into wealth, as Israel takes the curses, the slanders, and lies of the world and turns them into blessings, the real question is how could any good person not stand with Israel? Let the word go forth from Jerusalem, the eternal undivided capital of the Jewish people and the Jewish state, that Donald Trump and I are proud to stand with Israel. The American people are proud to stand with Israel. And should Donald Trump and I have the privilege of serving this great nation? If the world knows nothing else, the world will know this. America stands with Israel. Together, let us all pray that God continues to bless Israel and all her citizens, Jewish, Muslim, and Christian, with life, hope, and peace. May God bless you all. May God bless Israel. And may God continue to bless the United States of America. That was the very impressive uh, Mike Pence. It's nice to know that America's in safe hands. I was just, I just thinking while I was listening to uh, Mike Pence talking about Israel, um, how that uh, his video broadcast would actually go down with the likes of Jeremy Corbyn and uh, his followers. Uh, absolutely. So you've got a totally different language. And, and that's what we keep need, needing to pick up here. The mindset is the same. Uh, the problems are the same. There's a religious understanding which is the same. Um, and that's very different than what we've seen uh, before. To understand the situation, though, I think it's very important to realize that not all of the American jury will support the message from Pence. And uh, it's a fascinating political uh, dilemma. Absolutely. Um, but the other question I have to ask you, I mean, very much Mike Pence mentioned it. I think uh, Donald Trump mentioned it. And, uh, you know, previous uh, election campaigns have mentioned it, particularly from the Republicans, that they want to see the uh, American embassy move from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Now, what is the prospect we could see that actually happening under uh, Donald Trump presidency. Yeah, it, it's, it's a fascinating development because it looks like it could go ahead. Um, I think it's more important symbolically than anything else. Absolutely. It's a statement. What the consequences of that would have with the Palestinians, would have to wait and see. But it does seem that the Palestinians are, under this administration of the, uh, uh, in America, much more limited in what their response can be. So I think it would be a very clear message. We're having threats, though, uh, from many of the Arab countries that if that took place, that they, they wouldn't tolerate it, uh, that they may um, withdraw some of their uh, embassies from D.C. Uh, you know, I, I'm not sure. Let's, let's wait and see it. But why isn't 
the embassy of America in Jerusalem? Absolutely. That's the question. But, but also, do, do, do you think that, um, I mean, I think the Bob Dylan song, Times Are Changing, it, it definitely feels that we've got that. Are in you a Dylan fan? I am a little bit of a Bob Dylan fan. I prefer Coldplay, but um, I do like Bob Dylan. But I think that song sums up so well because I think times are changing. And uh, the fact that, for example, Theresa May and her government, the Department for um, International Development, has decided to suspend £25 million in aid to the Palestinian Authority, inferring this is going to Palestinian prisoners who have been involved in terrorism, paying them a salary, plus all the incitement to terrorism as well. Do you expect maybe that a Trump administration will start to look at American aid going to the Palestinian Authority and say, we're not going to fund this level of hatred in the education system um, and could this bring about fundamental changes within Palestinian society that's needed in order to bring about a, an eventual p peace settlement between the two sides? I'm very optimistic, I am very optimistic and I think it's well overdue. Uh, the decision by uh, um, the British government is very welcome. Uh, it was a result of my friend and colleague Kay Wilson uh, who is a survivor of a terrorist attack where her friend was murdered uh, and she was left for dead and today she's an amazing person yeah, right it's, on the program right she, a great person it's uh, the a legacy to the work um, of Palestinian Media Watch run by Itamar Marcus uh, these are organizations and people and individuals who said we have to stop sponsoring I'm not going to use the word incitement because it doesn't give it what it is program after program which is calling for killing of Jews uh, and martyrdom against uh, the Jewish people. And it looks like that maybe more pressure finally will be put uh, on uh, the sponsors. Absolutely. Uh, and also, what other changes do you think we'll, we'll, we'll see um, in terms of um, the Trump administration when it comes down to tackling the issue of worldwide anti-Semitism? I think there'll be a lot less uh, tolerance towards it. We keep saying, and we keep, I, I keep emphasizing, is the risk from the left. Anti-Semitism is not the monopoly of the far right. Uh, and what we're seeing is, and we've seen uh, in the UK with recent statements by Ken Livingstone, uh, uh, the Corbyn government, sponsorship for and support of both radical Islamic groups, uh, a rewriting of Holocaust history, uh, and a denial of Jews allowing to define their own identity and um, their own relationship uh, with Israel. If the left took any other group, whether they were women, whether they were black, whether they were whatever, and talked in the same way as they do about Israel and Jews, they would be called racist. It's only when they talk about Jews and Israel that's acceptable. And that, I think, is part of our double standard that we're facing as well. Absolutely. But also, they, they treat evangelical Christians exactly the same. 100%. So uh, we're in the same boat. I um, have to ask you uh, as well, in terms of um, Israel's incredible advancement in terms of science and technology, that, um, that Donald Trump as a businessman and an entrepreneur will really see the value in what Israel has to offer, surely? Well, you know, it's that old joke about uh, why do the Jewish people not like uh, Moses, because we spent a whole generation walking around the wilderness <laughs> to get to the only place in the Middle East that doesn't have oil. Although we discovered, dis you know, we, we discovered gas. What's our natural asset? Brains, technology, uh, and uh, developing programs which we then sell to America. Take the Waze program, for example, in medical aid, anyone who's using a phone, a computer. That's our natural asset. So uh, the uh, nation which has become uh, a nation which inspires technology is, is really, uh, I think, will be recognized not only by Donald Trump, but by anyone who's interested in uh, that, that, that field of development and technology itself. Absolutely. Um, one thing I have to ask you as well, this is something I don't know, what was the reaction of uh, Israelis to the election of Donald Trump? Because there's a big difference between Israelis and American Jewry. I think that there was... Uh, that it's mixed. On the one hand, I think that there certainly was a sense that the pressure from Obama um, has been lifted. Um, on the other hand, everyone's waiting. Everyone's waiting to see what next. This is the biggest surprise of the decade. Where are we going with it? What's his team? So I think there's a, on, on a popular level that there's a sense of let's wait and see. Um, but Israelis are, are split like everyone else in the world over some of the comments he made, which were very questionable. I have to also ask you as well, what do you think Donald Trump's relationship was going to be like with the UN? 
because certainly he's not going to like uh, this confederation of Arab states that are passing UN resolutions, attacking Israel, and they'll be attacking his government as well. Could we actually see ourselves in a situation where he just says, you know, I'm fed up with the UN, I'm pulling America out of the EU membership? I, I think that, that would be problematic. I think to some extent there has to be a world uh, body which people can be answerable to. On the other hand, we know, and you suggested absolutely, the problem of the United Nations uh, is um, its bias against Israel, its built-in bias against Israel. And for an organization which in many ways was created after the Second World War, uh, today it seems to be an organization that doesn't stop demonizing uh, Israel, totally without, um, you know, without, without any proportion. We always joke that two Jews, three opinions. In Israel, we have two Israelis, five opinions. We're not talking about, and, and the change of government, our national sport is having elections. That's not the issue. It's when Israel can do no wrong. It's a demonization. Um, sorry, can do no right. When it is a demonization, that's the problem that we're seeing. And it's happening in the United Nations today. And yeah. uh, what's the response? I mean, you, you've been in the United States. Uh, you're traveling here in the UK. You're meeting members of the Jewish community on both sides of the Atlantic. What is the reaction to this shocking uh, UNESCO vote on the status of Jerusalem and only referring to the Western Wall and uh, the Temple Mount by Islamic names and trying to disconnect that s centuries, if not thousands of years, connection between um, Jerusalem and the Jewish people? Shock. It's absolute shock. And again, it's a symbol of how far the United Nations has been let to uh, go. Um, these statements are not being, and these policies are not being challenged, um, and now they need to be. The fact that you can somehow rewrite Jewish history and say that, it's, that there is no relevance of uh, Jerusalem to the Jewish people, effectively, that's what they were saying, uh, I think was uh, felt and met by shock worldwide. Um, hopefully we're going to start seeing a change in the United Nations. Oh, it should be good. Also, some, some good news. Um, uh, this month, I've had the uh, pleasure of interviewing uh, Israel's uh, new ambassador to the European Union on um, my other program, the European Report, that we film in the European Parliament. And uh, he's also been appointed as Israel's first ambassador to NATO. Now, uh, that's an amazing achievement for Israel, isn't it, to be um, have an ambassador and uh, a place at uh, NATO headquarters. Again, we're starting to see uh, recognition of Israel's uh, significance as a supporter of the West, having the same values, um, being militarily important in the region. Um, we're seeing a situation where the Middle East is becoming more dangerous, where the mistakes of regarding Iran have to be stopped. So I think that that's a very, very uh, important uh, issue. 100% there. It's, it's absolutely right. So could we face uh, a situation maybe in a, a few years' time, particularly with what's happening with a, a resurgent Russia and Eastern Europe, and particularly looking at the shocking defense budgets of European governments, that actually Europe might actually need Israel defensively? Now you're jumping ahead. Uh, you're in a very optimistic mood today, Simon. Oh, no, it's because I've got you as my guest uh, on the programme, Neil. Being nice will get you a long way. <laughs> uh, we may wait. We'll have to wait and see on that. I'm not jumping ahead as, as perhaps as far as you are. Uh, but certainly uh, the importance militarily uh, of uh, Israel, uh, supporting Western values, supporting uh, the values of Jews and Christians and, and many moderate Muslims as well, um, can be felt in the future. Absolutely. Very good. i have to talk to you as well about um, this is an historic year that we're heading into in 2017. I know. I've got my 50th birthday. It's, 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 Congratulations. It's, it's, no, <laughs> I, uh, it's a tragic year. Uh, so not only do we have the 100th anniversary of the Balfour, but I think we also have the uh, 50th anniversary of the Six Day War as well. Um, and also, is it the 70th anniversary of the uh, UN partition plan? Right. So, uh, yeah, so we've got um, quite an amazing and important year coming up. But how important is Balfour and the Balfour Declaration um, to Israel, and how will Israel be celebrating? I think it's very important because, in w one level, it recognizes the uh, connection, again, of the Jewish people uh, to the land. What we do know is it's going to provide an opportunity for the opponents of Israel uh, to rewrite history yet again. We talked about UNESCO. The UNESCO uh, uh, declaration uh, or statement together with, or policy together with uh, uh, a reaction to Balfour are connected. Why? 
What we're seeing on the far left, what we're seeing with Islamic groups, remember you've got a connection between Islamic groups and the far left, which is crazy, is Balfour was a symbol of British imperialism, that it reflected the, the imperial countries ripping the region apart. The left, the United Nations, and many in America don't recognize the right of the Jewish people to the land of Israel. And that, I think, is going to be challenged as well. Uh, which needs to be challenged, doesn't it? Um, but how will Israel be celebrating the 100th anniversary of the Balfour Declaration? Uh, I'm not because aware yet whether there'll be parties in the streets, uh, but certainly on a publicity level, we'll be looking uh, uh, at it uh, and uh, remembering uh, uh, the commitment of the British people to recognise for the first time the right of a Jewish people in, oh, the, in the land. And also, do you, do you think this can build um, stronger relations between the British government and uh, Britain w with that of Israel, particularly now that... Uh, Britain finds herself out of the European Union, needing new trade allies that a natural and perfect trade ally would, would be Israel. Uh, it's, it's interesting because uh, today, um, as you mentioned, we're going to be seeing uh, Britain leaving uh, Europe. How does that affect Israel? Is it going to create the stronger ties as you're suggesting? Or is it going to make Israel's situation in Europe actually more difficult? In other words, are we now left to the hands of Germany, France. But these are questions we have to wait and see. What we are seeing is that Israel is also still trying to in, uh, increase its uh, connections and relations uh, with other European countries. We just had a joint military exercise with the French. Uh, European investment in Israel is very important. Um, so, like it, we're both agreeing, was it Do Dylan who said the yeah, times? Yeah, yes. The times are a changing. Absolutely, which which sums up the mood I think that we're living in. But uh, in terms of um, Israel, now I've heard from uh, the Israel's mission to uh, the European Union that they're upset that Britain's left because they felt that Britain was uh, the closest ally that. Um, Israel had in the European that's, Union. That's exactly what I, I, I'm suggesting. Is uh, but also then we have to also recognise that the policy or foreign policy of um, French President Hollande towards Israel has been shocking and that the French government is the most hostile government towards Israel in the Western world and it's the, f the French government that is pushing the European Union to recognise the EU guidelines to put pressure on Israel regarding the uh, building of uh, new homes in Jerusalem, which according to France and the European Union is the biggest problem facing the Middle East today. Again, we're seeing uh, uh, that criticism. It's nothing new within Europe. Um, what I would sus uh, suspect or expect is as follows. What we have seen, um, when Obama was in power, European, the European pressure on Israel uh, was somehow weakened. They didn't need to become an alternative voice. Obama and Europe's voice became the same. What we've seen in the past, uh, and I think we're going to see this uh, reemerge, is as America go further right, the voice from Europe again is going to increase. Pressure on from Europe is going to increase as an alternative to the right of uh, Trump um, and trying to put a, a third way forward. So ironically, we could, we could expect more pressure from Europe at a time when Britain's left, uh, and as you rightly said, uh, was somehow more pro-Israel and supporting Israel. So I'm expecting much more pressure from Europe, um, again, rising as a, a, an alternative voice to uh, the right of Trump. Yeah, unless uh, Marie Le Pen wins the uh, French presidency next year and... Who knows where the where new pin will keep, be Keep an that. eye on Germany and keep yep. an eye on Holland. Yep. Uh, you, people are forgetting, and I throw it into our conversation just so I can say I was right, the radical right in it, uh, which is growing in Europe, uh, which is beyond the pale of much of the expected norm. And we may well see that. And that can be a threat not only to uh, some of the Muslims living there, but also to... Uh, the Jewish population. So the Jewish population in Europe is, is caught between a rock and a hard place. Le Pen is no friend uh, of, of Jews uh, and many of those radical groups, right-wing right, right -wing groups we're seeing emerge, emerging is really quite frightening. Yeah, interesting times. And uh, let, let's finish uh, the programme in the last few minutes on, on a kind I'm of... I'm feeling happy. I, I am as well. Um, on, um, on Israel as well. Now Israel is going from strength to strength and uh, 
you know, in terms of the Israeli people, uh, is it that either Israel was ranked either number eleven or number five? As we the were most arguing happiest this. place uh, on the planet. Now, how how well, is that? Happiness how is, that? is growing. How is that? How Why? Is that? Because they watch your program. But other than that, uh, we're <laughs> of course they would. You know, that's what's so funny is we talk, spend so much time talking about politics. But if you go to Tel Aviv Beach, there's no parking because everyone's on the beach playing that annoying game with the ball. Oh, um, and Israelis are confident. Now, it's very funny. Everyone is predicting the end of Israel. We're here. Get over it. We're here to stay. We're increasing in the population. We're exporting. Our economy is strong. Tourism is thriving. And that's what annoys everybody. We're very happy because we're here. And, you know, the scenes of Tel Aviv are vibrant in parties uh, and uh, music. And you're missing the heat wave over in Israel at the moment as well. I know. Thank you for <laughs> reminding me. My feet are freezing. <laughs> Which is which is good, but but um, what's your most special place that you like in Israel? I mean, uh, of all the places and all the, what's your one special place? I love the old city. When you walk around the old city, uh, you can go back to the times of Bible and walk and trace uh, the very footpaths of some of the greatest people. You can walk down and see where Jesus walked. You can walk uh, the places, uh, and you just are consumed by uh, uh, history. And I think that that's the speciality. Uh, you can use your Bible as a tour guide in Jerusalem. Um, and that's what makes it such a special place. Absolutely. Uh, Neil, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on the Middle Always East. Always a pleasure. Always enjoy you coming on the program. So thank, thank you. you for giving us an update. And I just want to thank you for watching uh, today's uh, program. Despite some of the challenges that Israel faces in the Middle East and from Iran, uh, Israel has a new ally in uh, Donald Trump in the White House. Um, Great Britain's leadership under Theresa May is the most pro-Israel government since uh, Margaret Thatcher. So times are changing. Uh, so no wonder Israelis are now beginning to feel happy about the situation in the world, uh, which is a good thing. But also reminds us that we've still got to uh, pray for Israel. We've still got to pray for the Jewish people. We've still got to counter the lies of the left and lies of the Islamic fundamentalists when they talk about Israel. And we've got to defend Israel. Um, against all odds. But uh, I'll leave you with this uh, very fun and enjoyable song that explains maybe why Israelis are so happy. <laughs>